Good evening. I'm Sam Seams. I'm the CEO of the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association. And tonight, since we've been doing collegiate men's track and field and cross country for over 100 years, and women's track and field and cross country collegiately for over 50 years, we present you with the Collegiate Track and Field Cross Country Athlete Hall of Fame. Enjoy. The passage of time is marked in many ways. Days, months, and years are often how most of us measure the moments of our lives. But the great ones are held to a different standard. Their careers judged in seconds and minutes, feet and inches, meters and miles. Fans don't celebrate their birthdays or anniversaries. We remember their trophies and titles their records and wins. We recall the way they looked when they lifted their arms in triumph or stood waving to an adoring crowd. But tonight, we will take a look back on the greatest careers that collegiate track and field has ever witnessed. We'll explore their historic journeys, hear their inspiring stories, and honor their incredible legacies. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming the first ever to do it. And put your hands together for the inaugural class of the Collegiate Athlete Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. How are we doing? We want to welcome you to the inaugural presentation of the Collegiate Athlete Hall of Fame for track and field and cross country. And I can't think of a better place other than Tracktown USA to celebrate tonight. Let's give it a round of applause here. I'm Jordan Kent, and as we get a chance to see more than two dozen of the athletes that have shaped the history of collegiate track and field and cross country, we will have a wonderful host leading the way. Please put your hands together for John Anderson. I said I was going to have a podium. Um, welcome to the new Broadway show, One Man and His Music Stand. <laughs> Don't know when that will be debuting uh, quite yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Where? Yeah, stay loose. You've got a lot of work to do, more than I do. Uh, I look down front and this is a phenomenal group. I mean, I feel bad for the folks who came and saw Bob Dylan here last night. Um, they were a day early for the real legends, that's for sure. But I do, I, do, I do look around and just go, how about this place, huh? I mean, this is remarkable. Hayward Field across the street is fantastic, but this place is amazing. I was uh, thinking, well, I'll talk track, and now I come out here and I think, well, yeah, I could do a little something from Les Mis or Cats kill some time before we get done with this thing. Or I had this idea for you Hall of Famers, I'll let you think it over. You come up, get your medals, and then at the end we'll do Hamilton. <laughs> we'll see if we have any takers. Um, I probably should address this at the luncheon, I apologize. We don't want to do any changes uh, this late, that would be bad. Regardless, tonight, Tracktown USA, as Jordan said, the Holt Center for Performing Arts, this is the room where it happens the induction of the inaugural class of the Collegiate Athlete Hall of Fame. My name is John Anderson, which may not seem exciting to you, but it is to me because I'm surrounded of all these, I literally thought I'm going to forget my own name surrounded by these people. So I've cleared my first hurdle of the night by remembering who I am. Meanwhile, we're here to celebrate the greatest names in track and field, names that are instantly recognizable to everyone in this sport. Some names are just last names, like Owens or Rona. Uh, we have people that are recognized by their first names, like Wilma or just Carl. There are people that you only need part of the name, Pre. Uh, we have married names, Jenny 
Simpson. And then some people are just initials. We can just go JJK and everybody knows universally who we're talking about. Uh, there is also a John Anderson. He won the Olympic discus in 1932. Uh, he is not yet honored and I am not yet him. Uh, I qualified for this hosting job by winning both, hang on, hold on to your hats here, both the Green Bay City Championship and the Brown County Championship as a senior in high school in 1983. That is a, a feat that has only been accomplished by about like 68 other dudes. Uh, the other qualification, qualification I have, Susie, is that I'm the only guy at ESPN that knows what SPASH stands for. You and I, Stevens Point Area Senior High, that's it. And they're like, okay, you can have the job. Uh, I am thrilled to be here tonight to do this show and more importantly to make it a two-hour show so everybody can get home and, uh, and enjoy the rest of their evening. But the collection in this room is unprecedented. It is exceptional. It is, it is inspiring. I am going to look down to read off these numbers so I get them right. 205 collegiate championships, 99 world records, 19 Olympic gold medals. All of this accomplished while they were still in school, having to worry about intro to poli sci and econ one or accounting two or organic chemistry with lab. I'm sure some of you needed gut courses and took geology or something like that and, and good on you. Uh, in Journalism 101, I was taught a quote by Winston Churchill, and it, it, it reads, when you have an important point to make, don't be subtle or clever. And so with that, let me simply say, tonight we honor the greatest track and field team in history. <laughs> Times and heights and distances, of course, but what we have here are difference makers and leaders and culture changers. And to think all it took was 101 years to make this happen, maybe more. From cinders and yards to synthetic surfaces and meters, track and field is the oldest NCAA championship on the books. It is literally old enough to be recorded on ancient ruins. It's on scrolls, it's on urns, it's on pottery. But nobody's that old. We're just going to go to like 1921, just so you know. That's all the farther we have to go back. So the fact that there's a piece of pottery somewhere in Greece with an athlete that is just a dead ringer for Jenny Berenger, that's an accident. That's not, that's not really your likeness which is too bad because you can get paid for that now, right? You can dough it up. Uh, I poke at you because you're actually the youngest member of this class. And as she told me, I'm still competing, don't retire me tonight when we're up here. So we're not gonna do that. We're gonna let you keep on the roads and run, run, run. But if you pick any other sport, track and field predates it. In many cases, not just the championship, it's outlasted every other championship level. Football, basketball, rowing, yes, boxing, they don't do that anymore. Rugby, cricket, all of them. Track and field is still here. So the point I'm making is that this is really long overdue, which means we owe a debt of gratitude and should give a round of applause to the man who envisioned and poured his energy and enthusiasm and passion into this project. We saw him at the top, CEO of the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Coach Association, Mr. Sam Seams. And Sam, if you're wondering if I'm buttering you up because you're finally going to pay me, I am. Thank you. Uh, but it makes me feel guilty, though, because like, I'm positive not a single athlete anywhere in this house ever got paid a dime for their participation in track and field. Just amateurism, honor, spirit of competition, the purity of it all, and you know, those kind of things. But since I brought up the money, I have to say this. We have 30 athletes, right? We have 20 men's athletes, and we have 10 female athletes. And so for the guys, as I look down here, I don't know how to put this. There's 20 of you. I have 12.6 scholarships, some of you are going to have to walk on. <laughs> I don't know. Jim Ryan, maybe you could come for books. <laughs> Ralph Boston, we could reestablish your residency. I can get in-state tuition for you. Seriously, could you see Coach Telez going into Carl Lewis's house? Carl, we think you can be one of the greatest athletes in the history of the sport. Do you think your folks can afford tuition, room, and board to come to Houston? That'd be fantastic. For the ladies, now we've got enough scholarships as we continue to work to get everybody up to speed, but the 10 of you have helped push and elevate women's athletics as we celebrate 50 years of Title IX. You are groundbreakers, <laughs> trendsetters, pioneers, role models who are directly responsible for the growth and sport among girls and young women. I was out there today at Hayward, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, and you saw the thrill of Anna Hall meeting you, because people like you beget 
Anna Halls and Jasmine Morse, or Merlene Adi, who brings about a favor Ophelia, or Vicki Huber, who, who gets us Jenny Benninger, and then Jenny gets us uh, Abby Nichols or Lauren Gregory, some of the great runners we'll see from Colorado uh, the next four days over at Hayward Field in the championships. It's these kind of athletes, the excellence of their performance, that make up both the foundation of this sport and the future of this sport. It is proud, it is strong, it is diverse, and it is global, and it is in part because of all of you honored here tonight. The best of the best acknowledged and honored as Hall of Famers. We have athletes from nine different decades who have headlined and made history. Magically, wonderfully, for the purposes of this Hall of Fame exercise, um, you're all remembered as the same age. You're back to being college kids. And one more time, you finish first. One more time, because you are the inaugural class of the Collegiate Athlete Hall of Fame. And it is with a great honor and great pride we produce and show you our first group of Hall of Famers. The running of the Buffalo doesn't even come close to the speed of Colorado's Jenny Beringer. Her career saw dominance across the collegiate landscape in a variety of distances and events as this extremely talented runner captured an astounding four NCAA titles. And in 2009, she was undefeated in any distance on the track from 1,500 to 5,000 meters, setting collegiate records in five events along the way. The first collegiate woman to run sub four in the 1,500 meters, she even capped off that remarkable season by hoisting the Bowerman a college career that ran past them all. Here's Colorado's Jenny Berenger, and she's a Hall of Famer. Please welcome Jenny Berenger Simpson. And presenting the Hall of Fame medal, Colorado head coach, Mark Wetmore. who says pigs can't fly never witnessed Eric Walder's legendary leaps during his time as an Arkansas Razorback. With his amazing feats of gravity, Walder wowed the masses as he soared past his competitors to become arguably the greatest combination jumper in collegiate track and field history. In all, he combined to win 10 national championships in the long and triple jumps, which ranks as the most ever in the field events, and led the Razorbacks to four indoor and three outdoor NCAA team titles. And almost three decades later, he still holds the collegiate outdoor long jump record. Let's call the Hogs and call him a Hall of Famer, Arkansas's Eric Walder. Please welcome to the stage, Eric Walder. And presenting Arkansas men's head coach, Chris Bucknam and retired jumps coach, Dick Booth. Bit of a home field advantage here and let's go ahead and meet our next inductee. Bobby Morrow's running style was so poised and fluid, his track coach at Abilene Christian once famously remarked he could run a 220 with a root beer float on his head and never spill a drop. Now that's smooth, folks. As a freshman, Morrow glided to an NAIA 100-200 double victory, the first of three straight. A year later, he claimed the sprint double at the NCAA championships, as well as a trio of gold medals at that summer's Olympics, reaching the podium in the 100 and 200 meter dash and on the 4x100 relay team. Morrow set or tied the world record seven times in sprints during his collegiate days, and tonight, He's a Hall of Famer. From Abilene Christian, Bobby Morrow.
accepting on behalf of Bobby Morrow daughter Elizabeth Kelton and presenting Abilene Christian assistant coach Brielle Collette. This is cozy, isn't it? Come on down so I don't have to yell across the room at you. We're all good. <laughs> so we'll have several of these groups and visit with everybody here kind of in mass. And, um, save everybody the, the hassle and the stress of having to write a speech, right? You didn't want, you, do, how many Hall of Fames are you in? them a lot of time. How many um, Hall of Fames are you in? Uh, countless. No, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, Eric, what did you say? You're in? Uh, maybe a hundred. No, just kidding. Five. Five. Did you have to give a speech each time? Yeah, see, we saved you all a lot of, although you could, I guess you could have repurposed one of those for it. But. Uh, what would your father say about tonight if he was here to be with us? Oh, he'd be completely honored to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But he wasn't a guy that displayed um, his greatness to many people. No, he was very quiet. <laughs> um, yeah, so how would that have manifested itself? Like, would it just be, you know, just very quietly, or would he, would he... Would he engage and tell us more or let us in? Is it, was it no. a story tailor on this? No, absolutely not. No. Okay, so <laughs> we'll rely on you then. Give me, give me the first story he ever told you about track and field that you can recall. Uh, it wasn't about track and field. It was about football. Okay. <laughs> in high school. <laughs> right, because you're in Texas, and that's, and that's what they do. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he told me that uh, they had what they called goal practice uh, in the afternoon. Okay, and um, he wanted to go hunting, dove hunting, I think, with um, his cousins. So he skipped practice and uh, went, went hunting. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, his coach, his high school coach, said, you missed practice. You're off the team. He was like, oh, oh boy, this is bad. This is really bad. And he goes, I'll tell you what. I'm going to leave it up to your teammates. They're going to vote mm -hmm. on if they want you on the team or if they want you off the team. Now, who's going to vote a sprinter that's a receiver off a football team? <laughs> Especially one that can run that fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was nervous. He waited all day, and he thought he was a goner. And um, that afternoon, they voted him on, and, and he said he never did it again. <laughs> never missed another practice. Did you ever have a day, Jenny, that you did not want to practice? Um, you can't love it every day. So, <laughs> so what, what, yes. got you, what gets you through on those days? I think when you surround your people, yourself with really good people, there are days that you definitely do it for them. Mm -hmm. And I feel really fortunate. Not only did I surround myself with excellent coaches around the way, not by my wits or plan but the, the universe collided i was i was recruited by really intelligent smart people that saw a future for me mm -hmm. um so that came to me early and then i've had the incredible fortune i think one of the greatest fortunes of an athlete's career is to have consistency so i've had consistency in that coaching with mark wetmore and heather burrows my college coach is still coaching me mm -hmm. um, my dad teases did Mark know when he recruited me as a young buff that this would be a lifetime appointment? <laughs> and it, it really has been, so I, I owe a lot to them. Yeah, think about that. That's half your lifetime with them, right? If you, go, if you show up as 18, and I, well, that's incredible. Well, I think sometimes that they have parented me as long as my parents did. <laughs> yeah. Eric, consistency. Um, I, look, I look at your record, and it's just win, 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 win. Um, does that ever become a burden that you're supposed to be the guy that wins? Absolutely not. Uh -huh. I just look at it like um, it wasn't any pressure. I enjoyed it. Um, had a great bunch of guys that I uh, worked out with and competed with. So it was just a wonderful experience for me. Give me the line between um, I'm, I'm confident because I feel like I'm the best guy here and I'm going to win. But as we all know, if you get too much of that, any sport can bring you back down. So where's the line that I come in and I let, I want to intimidate everybody. I want them to know that they're jumping for second. But I still have to respect that group and the event. Well, I would say it was the relentless pursuit of happiness. And I'll just put it that way. 
That's it. That's it. If the other guys had been as happy as you, they also would have been able to jump 20 inches. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, uh, that's the way I look at it. Golly, I jumped like 18.6. I must be the most miserable bastard in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, amid all this success you had personally, though, you were on some great teams. What was it like to run for Arkansas in those absolute dynasty days? It was unforgettable. I mean, I was part of, I think, seven championship teams. Wow. And each one of those championships was different and unique among itself. So it was mm -hmm. a great experience. How did Coach Mack get you? Because, like, I mean, he likes distance guys. <laughs> he also likes jumpers as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a, le a line, uh, a, a legacy of jumpers. What's it like to be with Conley and, and, and Edric and yourself and, and those that came after you? I was the puff of the group. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Mike Conley, and, you know, Edric Coriel, you know, and a list of other jumpers. Uh, Gary, Gary Johnson, for instance, so Brian Wellman. So our jump camp was just like a uh, mini Olympics, kind of. So it was very... Very exciting, just just to show up every day and compete. Bobby Morrill, he probably had many Olympics, but he had Olympics Olympics <laughs> yeah. in, in in 1956. Uh, what kind of stories did he spin about going down to uh, Melbourne and, and winning in the 100 and the 200 and the 4 by one The thing he remembers over and over is the silence when he was on the podium is that he could, he said he could hear a pin drop with thousands of people in that stadium. The silence was incredible. And he was so honored to be there with the United States flag and um, honoring, honoring his country. He was a sprinter, but at heart, he's a farmer. What yeah. made him a good farmer? He had a green thumb. He just <laughs> knew how to grow things. Um, they always came out good. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, he's got packed. Yeah. Do we have time for yeah. a story? Okay. So when we were kids, my, my sister's down in the audience. Um, he would um, uh, catch jackrabbits. And I don't know if you've oh, yeah. ever tried to catch a jackrabbit, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's fairly difficult. And as a kid, I thought that was just normal. I thought everybody caught jackrabbits. <laughs> but he would come home and he'd have them in his pocket. This is who you've been talking to. And he would always ask us to pick which pocket. And he would always pull out a little bunny. But <laughs> <clears throat> Like there's fast and there's stopwatch fast, but I think catching jackrabbits fast is like... <laughs> It's another level of fast. Bobby Moore, when I said I came here, I literally all, all the names of the people that are here, I've been awestruck when it came through. Give me somebody that awestruck you before you were Jenny Barringer, Jenny Simpson. Yeah, to your, to your comments earlier in the, the beginning of this whole evening, I have the incredible pleasure of being inducted into this thing so young. And so many of the people in the class are people that were I mean, every single one of them, in some way, played a role in, in me getting here. Um, but specifically, I got to meet Jackie Joyner when I was in high school. I got to meet Jim Ryan when I was in high school. What they refer to um, when they refer to. You know, there's just so them. many people that really led the way. Yeah. Susie Faber was at Foot Locker when I was there. Uh, she, she had some good dance moves. I mean, there's just stuff. <laughs> you, you experience as a young person, and you just have no idea you know, that you're, that I had no idea, you know, that I would, I would really quite literally follow in their wake. So, um, as, as Mark often reminds and said so eloquently recently, uh, quoted to me, if we see far, it's because we stand on giants, and I certainly stand on their shoulders. That's terrific, yeah. What a wonderful, what a wonderful uh, tribute it is to those folks. Eric, is there anybody that took your breath away the first time you saw them? Um, there's so many people I can think of, but uh, Carl Lewis, as I would have to say. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, it, where's Carl? He had that effect on a lot of people. I think they went, Carl Lewis, oh my goodness. You know, you jumped just as far as Carl Lewis in a lot of time. Did, like, did you ever put your head around and like, oh, wow, I, I can jump sometimes as far as Carl Lewis. I mean, There's I like three really guys in the world that can say that. I never, never thought about it. I just competed. <laughs> yeah. But isn't that something, and, I, and we chuckle about that, isn't it something at some point, we make so much, this is a sport that we have a vast record book and we keep track of, you know, uh, it's the fastest at altitude, it's the fastest, not at altitude, it's the fastest, wind aid, it's, you know, all these marks that we try to keep track of. But at some point, 
the goal is to finish first. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody with an Olympic medal and I go, well, how far did you jump to get that? <laughs> you know, but I mean, do, do, you ever, do you ever think we overvalue that? Not necessarily. I think we just value ourselves on how much we compete and how much we put into training mm -hmm. yeah. and satisfaction that way. Yeah. Well, we value all of you. We value your time. Thank you so much, uh, we, your time, and congratulations. And now you can sit back and watch as we go to our second group of Hall of Famers that will join you. When Sports Illustrated names you Female Athlete of the Century, you know you've done something remarkable. Jackie Joyner dominated the sport of track and field, embarking on her legendary journey by becoming one of the most storied female athletes in UCLA's and competitive sports history. She led the Bruins to titles in the first two women's NCAA Outdoor Championships in 1982 and 1983 while winning the heptathlon both years, and later set a collegiate record in the long jump that stood for three decades. While still a Bruin, Joyner claimed the first of her six career Olympic medals. Welcome to the Hall of Fame, UCLA's Jackie Joyner. Please welcome Jackie Joyner Kersey. And presenting the Hall of Fame medal, UCLA Director of Track and Field and Cross Country, Avery Anderson. One more time for Jackie Joyner Kersey. And let's go ahead and meet our next inductee. Long before organized collegiate track and field was a reality for women, the Tennessee State Tiger Bells were the sprinting standouts of a generation. And Wilma Rudolph was undoubtedly the fastest woman on earth. Not only did she become the first American woman to win three Olympic golds at the 1960 Rome Olympics, she claimed four world records and became the first woman to win four U.S. titles in the 100 yards or meters, all while attending college. Now, Tennessee State's Wilma Rudolph is in the Hall of Fame. Accepting on behalf of Wilma Rudolph, Tennessee State Director of Track and Field and Cross Country, Chandra Cheeseboro Geis. And Chandra, we're going to have you stay up there because our next video is our next inductee. We all know that human beings can't fly. But Ralph Boston sure came close. The man who was known as Hawkeye Boston soared to a combined six world records during his legendary collegiate career. As a junior at Tennessee State in 1960, he won the NCAA title in the long jump and spent that summer winning gold in the event at the Olympic Games. A year later, he became the first person to break the 27 feet barrier in the long jump. Boston was so dominant, in fact, he nearly claimed the NAIA team championships for the Tigers all by himself during his senior season, as he scored 47 points in five individual events. Welcome to the Hall of Fame from Tennessee State, Ralph Boston. Please welcome to the stage, Ralph Boston. And presenting Chandra Cheeseboro Geis. Congratulations. Anywhere? Right here. Pop pop down. <laughs> Hey, we were to figure out how many cubic meters of sand you've been in your life. That, that, Redondo you, Beach. You got, yeah, you got, a big, much, you, yeah. Got, you got a big sandbox, that's for sure, when it comes through here. Uh, that's a nice reception, man. People, Thank you. people remember all the things that you did. I do, too. Good for you. <laughs> you got a favorite? Yeah. My, my favorite was the, uh, the 1961 NAIA championship. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, I came within two points of winning the meet alone by myself. Yeah, you, 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 told, you told me the story I'd like you to share it about how it is that you kind of got bamboozled into, <laughs> into second place. Well, I had won four events, mm -hmm. so that's 40 points. So you had the, the long jump? The triple jump. Yep. Two hurdle races, the low and the high hurdle, mm -hmm. and I was in the final three or four in the high jump. And uh, uh, Stan Wright came from Texas Southern, came up to me just before I took my final attempt in the high jump. And he said, Ralph, if you clear this height, you'll win the meet. I hope you clear it. <laughs> and I said, gee, what a nice guy. <laughs> and I backed off, mm -hmm. and it was my third attempt, and I never got off the ground. The bar hit me in the face. <laughs> And so I scored 47, uh, tied with another team, uh, mm -hmm. 47 points. And the trophy is still there, Chief. It's, it's still there. So now I don't want to run down your teammates, but where the hell were your, re your teammates if you had to do all 47 points? One was a sprinter who pulled up lane, and the other was a freshman who just really choked. I mean, he mm -hmm. literally choked. <laughs> but we'll leave their names out of that, because okay. they, they deserve better, right? How about Harvey Schmidt left? That'll work. <laughs> Wherever Harvey is, we apologize to him <laughs> when he came through. Um, Chandra, if he was a one-man team, the Tiger Bells, obviously, with Wilma, were famous for, my goodness, that, that is there a way to explain what they meant, meant that past, what they mean to the sport? Um, well, I feel like the, the my, yes, I feel like the Tiger Bells opened the door mm -hmm. for women's track and field. And uh, they didn't even have scholarships, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. They did work aid. Yeah. So we thank God for Title IX. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I can go what made her special, because she's fast. But, uh, but uh, there are a lot of fast people. What made Wilma Rudolph special? Um, well, we know that Wilma um, overcame polio at a young age. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a God gift. It was her time. And, uh, you know, when God has a plan for you, you just step in it and do what he asked you to do. Mm -hmm. It was her timing. Because every day at practice, Wilma had to compete against really fast women. Mm -hmm. Like um, Edith McGuire. No, Edith was after her. Um, May Fags and um, Lucinda Williams, all those young ladies. Um, if four Tiger Bells was in the race, they were wanting to know who was going to win it because they came one, two, three, four in the you, race. You needed to recruit them two, two or three of them over your side, and you won the tournament. You wouldn't have had to won the <laughs> meet. Wouldn't have had to worry about running the high jump bar. Uh, but you were contemporaries. You were at school the same yes, time. She yes, was. What was she like? Were, yeah, yeah. We traveled a lot together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she, she. I was afraid of flying. I didn't like flying. She loved flying and. When we'd leave the ground, you know, I would sweat first fire, and my bug eyes would bug out. She would, she, and she always laughed at me. She mm -hmm. always laughed at me. Mm -hmm. but, wow, she was some kind of runner. He got 47 points for doing five different events. He, he, somebody suckered you into doing seven for just 10 points. I feel like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know who your math professor was there at UCLA, but we could have probably done that better. Uh, what was the last time you thought, boy, I wish I hadn't given up basketball? I had <laughs> I love track and um, basketball. I love the team atmosphere and uh, and also what I learned from being a part of a team, but then being a part of the track and field team is that a lot of people look at it as an individual uh, sport, but when you're trying to win a national title, every point counts. So whatever I had to do, even if I didn't like it, I, I did it because we were trying to win a national title. When did you know you were good? Hmm. That long, huh? I know. Because, <laughs> you, you know, it's one thing about you do what you do because you love it. Mm -hmm. Every day you show up. Every day I listen. I remain coachable. And, and I knew from that point that I love showing up when it's 100 degrees and no one else is coming out to practice. And so it wasn't about being good. It was about being consistent and doing everything that my coaches had prepared me to do. And 
because I started running at the age of nine. I wasn't one of the best girls, but I wanted to be good. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that every day I show if I can improve a tenth of a second if I was running, half of an inch if I was jumping, that meant the work that I was doing was paying off. And I saw the 76 Olympic Games on television and saw women doing what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, maybe one day I can go to the Olympics and be on television. <laughs> and that was the goal. <laughs> So let me, let me turn that just a couple of degrees then if you're like, you need the consistency. That. When did you realize that you were good enough in the skills you had and if you worked hard enough could take you to places that you were, to the top of Olympic podiums around the globe to meets and, and, and those kind of things? So uh, we celebrate 50 years of Title IX. Mm -hmm. So in high school, uh, we, were, we had the top girls team, both basketball and track and field. And my mother wasn't going to allow me to run, uh, run track or do any sports because at that time, the boys were using the gym, gymnasium, and we had to come back at 6.30, and she just said, no, you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And But for me, I just stayed with it and showed up every day and went to uh, – the biggest thing was just trying to – you know, you see people make these national teams and they give you these, these big old bags and all this goodies in there. I'm like, Love the I gear. want one of that, you know, and, <laughs> and in hopes of just getting one of them bags with a whole lot of goodies, you know, <laughs> that no one else had. But, you know, now you make teams and, you know, you can go to a uh, local store and buy it, unfortunately. I guarantee it. I guarantee in 2022, all the athletes that have com com uh, qualified to compete over here at Hayward the next four days, they're all about the swag. They're totally in just like you are. They're not about it. How about you? What, what? No, you're not going to say that. They're huh? not only just about the swag. They're about performance. Sure, but they all love the swag. Yeah, like, it's like, what's swag, in the goodie bags? I'm, I'm totally in there, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So. Are the Bose right, headphones yeah. in there? I got to get those. <laughs> um, how about you? When you stood at the, at the runway, did you think, wow, I, I'm standing here at, and I could go to Rome and I could go to Tokyo and I could go to Mexico City? Like, when did it dawn on you? Like, the world is a possibility just running down and jumping into that I box. I it was August 12, <laughs> 1960, when I broke Jesse's record. Mm -hmm. Then it all came to, to fore. Mm -hmm. uh, until then, I was just, I saw myself as just a, another local yokel <laughs> trying, to, trying to do something. But when, when that thing hit that night, the world changed. Mm -hmm. It changed my life. And the world record changed, and now you have a complete set of Olympic long jump medals, the gold and the silver and the bronze. And That's fantastic. And he's got the NCAA medal, too. And he's got the NCAA championship medal, too. Thanks to the three of you. Uh, sit here a moment because you talk, we talked about the global and you talked about local Yoko. Uh, Ron Delaney, a Hall of Famer who couldn't be here with us tonight but does have a message from his home in Ireland. No luck of the Irish was needed when Ron Delaney left the starting gate. Instead, he used a punishing kick and his tremendous finishing speed to become the youngest sub four miler in the world. Those attributes and a slogan in the Villanova dressing room also propelled him to greatness on the collegiate level. It was winner bust for the Wildcats and Delaney as he claimed three straight NCAA 1500 meter slash mile titles and led Villanova to its first national crown. In the third lap, Villanova's Ron Delaney has the baton at a five yard lead. Time 3 11 and 9 tenths. A new pen relay record for Villanova's quartet. He also struck gold at the 1956 Olympics, racing to victory in the 1500 meters in the summer between his junior and senior seasons. From Ireland to Pennsylvania to the Hall of Fame, please welcome Ron Delaney. My favorite memory of the National Collegiate Championship, well, obviously the first one. But then the next year I did the Delaney double. I didn't think, don't think I ran as fast in the half mile, but it was great to do the mile and the half mile double. And especially when it was, it, you maybe got a half hour between races. In those days, you knew nothing about dehydration, rehydration. It was winner, boss, Jim Williams was a great leader, like the great leader Villanova has, the, has at the moment, Marcus O'Sullivan. Thank you, Marcus, uh, for being there today. 
gentlemen, ladies, and the lady winners, uh, please accept my congratulations on a lovely event, a lovely thought, 100 years of celebrating National Collegiate Athletic Association Championships. I'm delighted to be part of this celebration. Thank you very much, and love from Ireland. Accepting on behalf of Ron Delaney, Villanova's men head coach for track and field and cross country, Marcus O'Sullivan. Let's go ahead and meet our next inductee. Jerry Lindgren burst onto the distance running scene in memorable fashion. He shattered national records that stood for decades and became an Olympian, all before entering college. In his Washington State uniform, he won 11 NCAA championships in cross country and indoor and outdoor track, the most in history to that point, winning all but one NCAA race he entered. He was the first three-time individual winner of the NCAA Cross Country Championships. He's a collegiate distance legend, and tonight, he's a Hall of Famer. From Washington State, Jerry Lindgren. And let's meet our next inductee. The term record-breaking took on a whole new meaning during a three-month span in 1978. That's when Henry Rono embarked on one heck of a world-class journey. The Washington State product shocked those who follow track and field by establishing four world records in the span of 81 days. I mean, are you kidding me? It's one of the greatest achievements in the history of the sport. This powerful cougar dominated during his legendary cross-country and track career, winning six NCAA titles and setting numerous indoor and outdoor marks. Record-breaking indeed, and now he's a Hall of Famer. From Washington State, Henry Rono. Accepting on behalf of Jerry Lindgren and Henry Rono, current Washington State Director of Track and Field and Cross Country, Wayne Phipps, and former Washington State Head Coach, John Chaplin. Gentlemen, we'll call this the cool down lap here. So go ahead and hang on to this. We're going to ask you guys a few questions here, just looking back at the legacy of these two athletes. And you start with Jerry Lindgren and just what he meant as a three time cross country champion. Can you really put into perspective just how impressive that feat was when you look at the competition? I mean, we saw Steve Prefontaine up there that he was edging out. What did that mean when you really take a chance to look back and examine it? Well, I think any, any question. Uh, regarding Jerry or Henry, I'm obviously going to defer to Coach Chaplin and, uh, and and his iconic teams. And I think both uh, Henry and Jerry, if you look uh, back, probably two of the most, if not the most, uh, iconic distance runners in the history of, of collegiate track and field. Mm -hmm. well, Jerry Lingren, of course, <clears throat> in high school, beat the Russians, and I think that's when it started. <laughs> this little scrawny kid we called the Sparrow. You know, and he beat the Russians, and that was the next year. Of course, he's a freshman, and that year he ties the world record with in the in the six miles. He was a very unique individual. I mean, little scrawny kid, and he got a major in Russian and did that kind of stuff. But he was a really tough competitor. His senior year, he won the five and ten thousand all three years in a row, and a double. Won the cross country and two times, he won the uh, the uh, my, two miles. He lost to Jim Ryan, was his only loss in college. And he, he is in, excuse me, so in the five and the ten in his senior year, he was hurt. He wins the ten. He's in, he wins the ten, and he's in the, he's in the final of the 5,000. With a lap to go, he is fourth. Somehow, some way, that scrawny little kid inside <laughs> managed to be nailed all those guys and still win his third title. Mm -hmm. That's what I always remember. Very impressive. 
Henry Rono was totally different. Henry Rono, the first year as a freshman, he had a, a team member named Samson Kiwamba had, broke, had set the world's record for the 10,000 meters. And we were running in our canyon run in the fall and cross country and he is making look Sam, Samson look like a schoolboy. And I called him into my office and I said to him, you know, you could be the first man to break the world's record in the five, the 10 and the steeple because you have to have a good steeple chase to try this. I said, they're very weak events still and they were. And he says to me, do you think I can do it? And like most coaches, I sucked myself up and lied. He said, of course, son. <laughs> <laughs> we sat down and made a plan. And it was like a machine. I told him what to run, where we're going to run the first race, then I run a second one to solve any problems, and then the run, run the race for the record. And bit by bit, he did everything just like that. And it's all he had. Very quiet, never got excited. And I doubt that anybody else will ever hold the three Olympic records, the five tennis steeple, plus the 3,000, which is the IAAF, now World Athletics, two mile. One more round of applause for a plan that you lie to start with, but obviously a lot of truth in the result. Let's go ahead and meet our next inductee, Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan already was a celebrity by the time he first stepped on the track at Kansas's Memorial Stadium. That happens when you become the first high schooler to break the four minute barrier in the mile, as well as the youngest American male track athlete to ever qualify for the Olympics. As a Jayhawk, Ryan boosted attendance and shattered records as he compiled victory after victory during his collegiate career, culminating in a handful of NCAA titles, four world records in three events, and several appearances on the cover of Sports Illustrated. His collegiate record in the 800 stood for an astounding 50 years, which is even more remarkable since he was known foremost as a miler. Let's give a rock chalk Jayhawk for Hall of Famer, Jim Ryan. And please welcome to the stage, Jim Ryan, presenting the Hall of Fame medal, Kansas head coach, Stanley Redwine. One more time for Jim Ryan, and let's go ahead and meet our next inductee. With his signature shades and speed to burn, Nebraska's Charlie Green looked oh so cool crossing the finish line. He looked even cooler standing atop the winner's podium, which he ascended on a regular basis. The Husker Speedster won individual titles all six times he lined up at the NCAA championships, including three in the 60-yard dash and three in the 100, and tied world records in both events during his illustrious collegiate career. To this day, Green still holds Nebraska sprint records, and he's the first Husker to win Olympic gold. Let's give a hearty Go Big Red for Hall of Famer, Charlie Green. Accepting on behalf of Charlie Green, daughter Sybil Green, and presenting Nebraska Associate Head Coach Justin St. Clair. Let's meet our next inductee. Billy Olson quite literally pushed American pole vaulting to new heights during his collegiate career as he put on a dazzling assault on the record books during his time in an Abilene Christian uniform. Olson set 11 indoor world records as a Wildcat while he helped ACU become the nation's number one collegiate pole vaulting power before he became known as the first man to ever vault 19 feet indoors, Olsen soared to eight straight NAIA indoor and outdoor titles while leading ACU to its first team championship in 1982. Olsen raised the bar and the standard for American pole vaulting during his collegiate career. And tonight, Abilene Christian's Billy Olsen is in the Hall of Fame. Please welcome to the stage, Billy Olson, presenting Abilene Christian assistant coach, Brielle Collette.
And let's meet our final inductee for this group. With his mutton chop whiskers and unorthodox style of clearing each obstacle, Southern University's Rodney Milburn was super fly as he flew past all comers in the high hurdles. In 1971, his sophomore year, he claimed track's longest standing world record at the time, and Hot Rod was on one heck of a streak. Milburn remained unbeaten in 27 races that season and he parlayed that success into a gold medal in the 110 meter hurdles at the 1972 Olympic Games, tying the world record in the event. He never lost to a collegiate opponent while amassing 12 titles in NCAA and NAIA competition. Now, he's a Hall of Famer from Southern, Rodney Milburn. Accepting on behalf of Rodney Milburn, son Rodney Milburn III, and presenting University of New Orleans head coach and Southern alum, Brian Johnson. Man, each group that comes out is better and better and better. So don't, don't leave don't that. Don't forget that. Don't leave don't it. Worry, it won't. Thank you. Tell us what that one is. That's the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom that I received a couple years ago. It's a very special honor. Uh, happy to be a recipient by the grace of God all these years, and I'm still alive, and I got it before I died. <laughs> That's very special. Wow. Hmm. So they don't just give that to anybody either, just like this. It's, it's very special. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, our children all commented on the fact, again, Dad, you got it before you died, so be grateful, and I am. Very good. Um, it's kind of shiny. I'm trying to not be distracted by it. I'm going to start uh, down there with you, Rodney the Third. What, what would your dad say about this moment? He's got a mic. It's good. We don't have to pass that thing around. Oh, all right. I would say it'd be such an honor uh, to be amongst his comrades, you know, and uh, track and field family. Uh, I remember growing up, going to meets. Uh, as he was a coach, uh, watching the workout at U of H. So uh, this would just be a, being amongst family, if you will. You know, if he was here, that's why he would feel, he would take it all in. It was part of the narr narration, he kind of, the, the charisma of him hurtling just kind of jumps on the screen. He seems cool, was he a cool dude? Very laid back, uh, uh -huh. not cocky, just kind of all to himself, uh, going about life, uh, never bragged or boast about what he accomplished to me mm -hmm. as his son. I had to hear about all the great things from family and friends and comrades, you know. But my dad never sat down and tooted his own horn, you know. Mm -hmm. He was the type of person that took it all in stride and went about the day's business, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you like going to meets with him? It was fun. It was fun, you know, just the track and field atmosphere, you know. That's what uh, I got the most out of, just watching everybody get excited when, you know, the, the finals and, you know, just watching athletes compete. You know, that was exciting for me, hearing the crowd roar when somebody is behind in a race and somebody's coming behind, you hear the ooh, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's into it, you know, so that kind of, you know, sit with me as a, uh, uh, kind of just amongst, you know, people that enjoy the sport of track and field, you know. Mm -hmm. Billy, when you were on the runway, you, you, I mean, everybody was watching, right? It wasn't having to watch people come from behind, like you had everyone's attention. They were waiting for something great to come from you. Um, we channel that kind of energy. Uh, it would frighten some. How did you, how did you use that? Well, first of all, I wanted to land in the pit. <laughs> sure. Sure. I, I was never nervous jumping. It was mm -hmm. just something that I could do. I always had a a love of it and no fear of it. And I think that's really necessary if you're going to be a, a successful pole vaulter. Mm -hmm. we, we had a great crew at my college. We had a guy named Tim Bright who jumped 19.4, a guy named Brad Persley who jumped 18.10, and a guy named Dale Jenkins who jumped 18.8. <laughs> we were all there at the same time. So it was incredible mm -hmm. uh, just being around those great athletes. And that's I think that benefited us all greatly. There are people, you can set records by by you know centimeters or a quarter of an inch you have it but when you there's certain barriers to break so when you're the first guy over 19 because that's a flat number it's not 18 six and a half or, what's it like when you're the guy who breaks a barrier 
I mean, I was fortunate. I broke 11 world records during my career. That The 19-foot jump was the first one that kind of just shook me. Uh, it was something that I jumped at a lot of times, and I never had any success until I finally made it. I jumped at it a number of meets mm -hmm. in succession and, and couldn't quite make it. But I remember when I cleared the bar and, and landed in the pit, I tried to stand up, and I couldn't even stand up. My legs were just like jelly. So that was a special, that was a special one. What goes through a guy's head on the way down? It depends on if you were successful or not. I'm talking, wait, we, we just made 19 and it's successful. It, that, that was, for me, it was like a total elation. I, I had had, my father had gotten me personalized license plates about three years before that said 19 feet on it when I was an 18 foot pole vaulter. So I, I drove around town and everybody, you know, would call me the 19 footer way before I was ever a 19 footer. But uh, that was a lifelong goal of mine and to be able to achieve it was Pretty special. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that your husband was, uh, most people lifelong goals to have a gold medal. Actually, my father. Um, so what, what, what did he tell you about his Olympic experiences? Um, I think he enjoyed being at the Olympics. I think he enjoyed the team atmosphere. Um, he met my mother at the Olympics and mm -hmm. they got married three months later and they were married for 53 years. So I think the Olympics for him was probably. And good for you as well. <laughs> and good for me, I guess yeah, I wouldn't be great. here. Right, turned, turned out, out great, great for me. Great for you, right. it came through. Absolutely. Um, like he, he, it's hard to be a Nebraska legend and not play football. But I've been to Nebraska and I've been to the, the, the old Devaney Center and seen the track meet and he's a legend yeah. there. What's, it, what, what, what's the reception? Because obviously, um, he only, we only lost him a couple years ago. What was the re reception like when he would go back? Um, you know, Nebraska takes care of their athletes and they love their athletes, mostly because there's not much else in Nebraska except for <laughs> football, um, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest, because I'm not from Nebraska. But, um, <laughs> you know, they love their athletes and they love their athletes that are exceptional. And so he always had a lot of support and um, people that really appreciated him and always made him feel good, so. Any chance he would have been just as fast in contacts? Because like the glasses were kind of a part of his thing. Yeah, the shades were definitely his thing. He, um, he, he, he really lived by that. He loved the shades, his re-entry shades as he called them, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta have the re-entry shields. Um, you broke a world record and you couldn't even make the varsity. That's a hell of a thing. It's it's certainly an interesting time, isn't it? It is. You know, John, if I can share this with you, uh, I was the guy who in junior high was cut from the church baseball team, so it wasn't like there was a bright future. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember going to bed at night and saying a very simple prayer, Dear God, uh, I really appreciate if you'd help me make something of my life. And then I'd recount being cut from the church baseball team and mm -hmm. cut from the basketball team. And then I'd end the prayer with, and if you have something for me in sports, I'd appreciate if you show up sooner than later. <laughs> so, you know, that it came to be a world record uh, was not even my spare of thinking. I had a wonderful coach, Bob Timmons, who was not only my mentor, but he was a visionary. He was, after my fourth high school race, we were riding a school bus from Kansas City back to Wichita. And uh, he, had the, he always had the, uh, he always called each of the athletes up to the front to visit with them and challenge them. My day, my time, I was, I won that day 421. I sat down and he said, now how fast do you think you can run? And I was so immature. I mean, was a sophomore in high school. I thought I might run a couple seconds faster with the wind behind my back, which as you know, on an oval track doesn't happen. <laughs> and and then, he, then he proceeded to say, I think you can be the high school record holder, which was then held by the school I was in at East High School. And I run faster than that. And I thought, how is that possible? Because I was thinking in terms of my head hurt, my legs hurt, my lungs hurt. Uh, and you know, you, you only think of what you have at that moment. And then he said, I think you can be the first high school boy to run under four minutes. And eventually it led to a world record. So he was the kind of guy who every athlete needs to have in their life, someone who's willing to present a challenge and provide the, the workouts along the way to make that happen. So world record, I was grateful. In fact, my wife, Ann, is out here. She, she came up after the world record in Berkeley when I ran 351.3 and said, may I, may I have your autograph? And <laughs> being the really swell guy from Kansas, I said, how about later? Fortunately, it was on a blind date, Thanksgiving right. 1966. We've been married over 50 years now. My, my wife, Ann, is out here as well. 
But, but she was a groupie. <laughs> I'll let her respond to that one. <laughs> no, when she came through. When you were running, four minutes was still magical. And it's, yes. it's amazing that it's still magical today. And yet, I don't want to say it's commonplace, but why is it so many kids are able to hit that now? Well, in my day, when I ran into four minutes, there were two others that followed behind me, Tim Danielson and Marty LaCorey. Mm -hmm. And then there was this long gap before anybody else did. So there became the thought that if you ran fast early on, you would burn out. Mm -hmm. And that held back a lot of people, a lot of young runners. And now we've had a breakthrough, and I think there's a greater understanding that, you know, you can run fast early and still continue to mature and grow. Mm -hmm. uh, I would challenge those as you listen. Uh, you can go to our website, ryanrunning.com. Uh, and on that, I list June 4th, 1964. I give the background under the first, for the first high school four-minute mile, and I give a lot of the workouts. In fact, one of the policies that my coach had was to break down a race every 110 yards, so he's got all mm -hmm. the splits. But what happened then that night was trans transformed my life. It was my coach's goal to start with, and I thought, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. We'll do it. And it became more, you know, I was the first high school boy. Mm -hmm. That night as I was lying in bed, I thought, wow, what happens if I take ownership of this and I get really more involved? And, and so I did. I started doing more things like sleeping correctly, eating right, mm -hmm. right, all that. And it led to world records. But it was Coach Timmons, the gift God gave me, and it led to some wonderful experiences that we can all relate to, how our lives were being transformed by the experiences we had in athletics. So the producer wants me to wrap this up, but I'm just real quick, David, I'm going to point to this and tell you I get an extra question just because he's got one of those. And if you want to cut me off, do it at your own peril. Uh, are you ever shocked that some of your times, though, uh, are still, I mean, you would be at the front of every race still today in 2020, whether it's the half or the 15th? I, I am still shocked, yes. In fact, I was reminded in coming out that the half mile stood for uh, 50 years in an NCAA record. So. Mm -hmm. You know, those were moments in time which uh, you have a hard time reflecting on that it happened to you. Uh, and again, especially as I look back as a child when I was cut from those teams, I would never have imagined my life would turn out as it is. But it's an answer to prayer. I thank God for the talent, and I thank him for all the wonderful people who've put in my life, including my wife, Ann, who's put up with some enormous, <laughs> wonderful things and some real challenges, especially when you run for political office. People say some horrible things about you, and she had to listen to that and kept praying, and we're still married today, happily married. And I point that out because if, if, if the rest of the people involved in this panel right here were to run in the next four days, Charlie's times will be competitive. 19 would put you pretty much at the top of the heap over there, and Rodney Milburn's times. Trey, Hunting, Trey Cunningham is exceptional, but he'd still challenge for the podium. All these people, uh, fantastic performances, fantastic athletes, and the reason you're all Hall of Famers. Congratulations. Let's meet our next group, if we could, please. General George S. Patton, once called Harrison Dillard, the best bleeping athlete I've ever seen. High praise indeed. Slight in build, but mighty in prowess. Bones, as he was known, quite literally put his small college of Baldwin Wallace on the map. Dillard powered past his competitors to claim NCAA and AAU titles in the 120-yard and 220-yard hurdles in back-to-back -back years, and set or tied the world record a combined five times, four at the longer distance. And if that's not impressive enough, he once won 82 consecutive finals, outdoors and indoors, in the high hurdles, low hurdles, and sprints, the longest streak in track and field history at the time. From Baldwin Wallace, please welcome to the Hall of Fame, Harrison Dillard. Accepting on behalf of Harrison Dillard, Louisville assistant coach Jeff Petersmeyer. And one more round of applause for Harrison Dillard. Let's meet our next inductee. John Woodruff blazed into the record books and stunned the sports world with his come from behind gold medal victory in the 800 meters at the 1936 Olympic Games. Did we mention that he was only a freshman at Pitt at the time? Facing more experienced runners, Long John, as he was known for his lengthy stride, 
simply would not accept defeat. Woodruff wouldn't be denied as a collegian either, as he raced to three straight NCAA 880 titles and three consecutive IC4A 440 880 doubles. In fact, he never lost a collegiate outdoor race in three years of varsity track competition. Hail to Pitt and hail to his Hall of Famer, John Woodruff. Accepting on behalf of John Woodruff, Pittsburgh head coach Alonzo Webb. Let's meet our next inductee. As a child, Sally Kipiego ran more than 15 miles a day to attend school in her hometown in Kenya, and she kept running until she became one of the most accomplished distance runners in NCAA history. At South Plains College, then at Texas Tech, Kipiego kept winning races until she had won 16 national titles, combining NJCAA with NCAA glory. A dominating performance on the women's 5,000 meters. She completed her collegiate career as a nine-time NCAA champion, tied for the most in the NCAA, and became the first female in Division I history to capture three consecutive cross-country titles. This Red Raider ran right into the record books and into the Hall of Fame. From Texas Tech, Sally Kipiego. Accepting on behalf of Sally Kipiego, Texas Tech Director of Track and Field and Cross Country, Wes Kitley. So Wes, I'm gonna do something I did well in my career and that's pass the baton to you here right now, sir. So there you go. And I just want to ask you about Sally. What do you think it was that truly separated her from the best of the best? Uh, she hated to lose. <laughs> uh, and I mean that, that's a cliche, but you just didn't know her. Uh, she, she just detested to lose and uh, just so proud of her. And, you know, the two and a half years that we had her to win nine NCAA championships, uh, she's definitely the greatest of all time at Texas Tech and uh, I think just one of the greatest ever. Through all the accomplishments, is there a particular race or season that stands out as far as something that just truly made an impression on you? Well, I don't know that there was just one race or uh, she dominated uh, most, you know, I think the thing that impressed us, we put her in the five and the 10 and then uh, we were trying to help her uh, to get a pro contract and we put her in the 15 and then we had to, to face Jenny and <laughs> that's the only time that she lost. And so running the 1500 and the mile indoors and so, uh, we were just so proud of her. Uh, she could run anything from the mile up. I'd probably run a grade 800 if we'd put her in it, but uh, just tremendous athlete and tremendous person. Got her nursing degree there, and uh, I want to mention she would be here tonight, but she's about to have her second child, and oh. so uh, couldn't be traveling tonight. A lot of times we ask athletes the impression a coach made on them, but what was the impression she made on you? Well, she just elevated our program at Texas Tech tremendously. And just to see, uh, you know, she would be on her feet from seven at night to seven in the morning doing her clinicals and then go work out with Coach Murray uh, in the mornings or whenever and just uh, her dedication and the love for the sport. Well, thank you again for representing her one more time. Congratulations to Sally Kipiego. And let's go ahead and meet our next inductee, Vicki Radowski Huber. By the time Vicki Huber crossed the finish line at her last NCAA championship, claiming yet another individual title for herself and a program first team title for Villanova, she became the catalyst for one of the greatest dynasties in women's cross country history. Villanova went on to win a record six straight team titles and Huber was the spark that ignited that flame. Huber burned bright as she collected eight indoor and outdoor NCAA titles in all, setting five collegiate records along the way. In the 3,000 meters, she swept the indoor and outdoor national titles three straight years. V for Villanova's Vicki Huber as she enters the Hall of Fame. Please welcome Vicki Huber-Radowski.
Presenting the Hall of Fame medal, Villanova women's track and field and cross country coach Gina Procaccio. One more round of applause for Vicky as we get set to meet our next inductee. Say the name Pre, and everyone knows who you're talking about. Steve Prefontaine was a Sports Illustrated cover boy at 19 and an inspiration who fueled a national running phase. His hard-charging, run-from-the-front approach to racing may have defied conventional wisdom, but Pre became unstoppable after his freshman year of cross country, winning every collegiate race longer than a mile in his remaining days at Oregon. He collected seven NCAA titles, three in cross country and four in the three mile 5,000 and owned every American record between 2,000 and 10,000 meters. The echoes of Go Pre still ring out at nearby Hayward Field. Today, we enthusiastically cheer Go Pre as Oregon Steve Prefontaine enters the Hall of Fame. Accepting on behalf of Steve Prefontaine, sister Linda Prefontaine, and presenting Oregon head coach Robert Johnson. And one more time for Steve Prefontaine as we meet our next inductee. We started to add up the list of NCAA and Big Ten titles Susie Favor compiled during her illustrious career in a Wisconsin Badger uniform, but frankly, we lost count. For starters, there's a record nine NCAA Division I track titles, the most ever by a woman, as well as victories in 54 of 56 collegiate finals, including her final 40 races. But Susie Favor is legging it out. Favor all the way to the line, and Favor wins it. Jones takes second. And when you win that many competitions, you win awards too. The recipient of the 1989-1990 Broderick Honda Cup, Favor made a profound impact as a middle distance runner to stake her claim as one of the nation's top female collegiate athletes. Now, she's a Hall of Famer too. Please welcome Wisconsin's Susie Favor. And welcome to the stage, Susie Favor presenting Wisconsin head coach Mick Byrne. And a round of applause for Susie Favor. So I was doing the math back, and I believe between you and you and Pre, uh, I think in NCAA championships, you all lost once. Hard to miscount one. I have to really be a math whiz when and you go there. <laughs> okay, so that's two. It was like an R2. It was off by 100%. That's terrible. Um, well, you were first out, so we'll start with you. Uh, when you watch that, uh, what do you think of that, that gal that was running? A lot of times when I look back on my career, I kind of compartmentalize, like that's a whole other person, mm -hmm. a whole other life. And sometimes I would read articles and I'd be like, wow, that girl was pretty good, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that really helped me to keep everything real and to stay hopefully humble um, and to just take every race as um, in itself and know that there was always a race after that. Mm -hmm. So never to get too high on my britches, really. Mm -hmm. They say one of the worst questions you can ask somebody is how do you feel right after a race? Because you've all just expended yourself and that's why you always get the answer, uh, I, 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 I don't even have words for it, which doesn't do us any good. But now that you've had some time away from this and you look at this and what you started and you look at the Villanova program and what went on for that next 10 or 12 years, how do you feel about your role in that? I'm, I'm actually very proud of it. I, I love that Gina was who the one that presented me with the award. Um, when Gina came to Villanova, she was transferred from Florida, and I thought she was gonna beat me up every day. Um, 
but she, I admired her so much and her, uh, my sophomore year, um, just being her teammate, uh, she was the one that rallied us, you know, uh, going into NCAA cross country and just encouraged us to work hard every day. And, and that in turn, um, I was able to carry that hopefully mm -hmm. to the girls after me. And I think that that she started the tradition and now she's coaching mm -hmm. and has been there for 18 years. I don't know. So um, I think that the team that we had that first year really, really mm -hmm. created an amazing tradition. And how about when you look at women's distance running as a whole right now? Because the U.S. is, I mean, we've got a juggernaut between the, the, the gals running in the steeple with, with Colbert and Ferrix or, or uh, what Jenny has done and, and Carissa and Cran I mean, do you look at this and go, my goodness, what I have, what I have wrought? <laughs> I, I take no credit for it. <laughs> um, I think that um, when Susie and I were running, it feels like we stood out. You know, we, we definitely were standouts, and I feel like there's there are some standouts, but it's so deep now. Mm -hmm. I mean, women cle women collegiate running is so deep. Um, American women running is so deep, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's exciting. Well, you know, when I first came out here three years ago, it was the first time I'd come here uh, to cover a meet. And I checked into my hotel, and I got my car, and I drove up to Freeze Rock because that's what people do in Eugene. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Coach Johnson as he walked out, and he said, you know, there's a pre-quote when people went out, go to the first, go, go out to the starting line here at Hayward Field. Um, I am amazed at the legacy and the legend and the staying power of your brother. What do you think of it when you see it and, and live it every day? Definitely mixed feelings. Sure. Um, but it's such an honor that all these years later, he's still a big name within the sport. Mm -hmm. Actually, outside of the sport as well. Um, his quotes <laughs> affect everyone, not just people that are in track and field. So, um, you know, it's pretty amazing that he still is talked about today. And just two nights ago, we had a symphony created called Steve Prefontaine Symphony mm -hmm. that they, a composer wrote an entire symphony for Steve and it was right here two days ago. So 47 years later and he's still getting attention. Would he be astonished by that, you think? Aston would he be? I think he would be very humbled by it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think as many people, I think that accuse him of being cocky. Uh, there's a difference between confident and cocky. And if you actually listen to some of his interviews, if you pay attention to what he's saying, they're not cocky. You don't say, oh, I think I can win if I, if I run this pay. I think that's not cocky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's people just trying to be people. <laughs> we, we, we read a lot of the quotes, right? There's been, what, two movies. Uh, but tell us something about him that just like, give me something that why he was like every family. Give me some annoying brother stuff. I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah, I want, an, I want some family dirt. Oh, family dirt. Okay. Well, no, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, well, he was kind of a typical older brother, two years older mm -hmm. in school. While I was in grade school, he used to pick on me all the time. And, um, he, and then he would threaten me. He would say, well, you wait, to get, you wait till you get in high school. You know, I'm going to have all my friends, you know, um, not beat you up, but you know, terrorize you. And he did that up until I got into high school, and then he did a reversal. It's like, nobody touched my sister. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, walking up and down the hallway, it's this stuff all the time, you know, this stuff. And uh, I've had a few red bellies, <laughs> if people know what that is, a red yeah. belly. I've had a few red bellies. Mm -hmm. um, I had older brothers, yeah, I know what that is. Okay, <laughs> oh yeah. But I was, I tended to be the experiment. So I think if somebody did something to him, then he turned around, came home and did it to me. Mm -hmm. So um, it was entertaining. Is there anything people get wrong about him? Oh, yeah, well, when they say he's cocky and, mm -hmm. yeah. and self-centered, and that, I don't think that that's, um, I don't think that's accurate. He was a um, caring, thoughtful, 
a human being. And I think that's part of his legacy uh, today is who he actually was and um, how, he, how he carried himself and the things that he did that he didn't go out and publicize. He didn't, wasn't about attention seeking. Um, so I think he would be uh, humbled by, definitely humbled by everything that's still going on in describing, in keeping his name afloat. I should say. Um, so it's very, what does pre mean to you when you come here and you see that? And I mean, I, I don't know that there's anybody that's run a mile that doesn't, or two or three that doesn't think of Steve Prefontaine. Right, inspiring for one thing. And living here in Eugene uh, for four years, just having this Prefontaine classic, what a gift to have that. Um, he brought that to us. So many amazing athletes have brought that to this community because of Pre. So, I mean, he was a remarkable athlete. Mm -hmm. And he had said one time, I think the, the quote was something about, if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to bleed to, to do it. Um, what did you think when people challenged you? What went through your head? Well, when it came to Vicky in college, I was scared to death <laughs> because I had this pressure that I put on myself to always win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when that possibility of being beat, it was tough. It was a mental game. I had to learn to just relax. And um, you were very tough to beat. <laughs> yeah, and I only did it once. Um, but I'm, I'm lucky to have had great athletes to compete against. We saw your time uh, in your video click up in the, in the, half, in the 800, 159.12. Uh, I believe that's been corrected now to 159.11. We we'll rounded down. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that is still the NCAA 800 record in and the meet, not not for the collegiate. It's still the meet record. And I didn't know that. So, John, thank you for telling me that. You, you told me that earlier. So, if you went out there uh, in the in the qualifier for the women on what, uh, the Thursday, yeah, what what could you lay down now for us for two laps? What do you got? Um, I probably could do a. Three minute and 50 seconds. <laughs> oh, come on. Three, I'm not buying that. No, I'm serious. I, I'm, I'm totally serious. I, I run nine minute miles now. Mm -hmm. So my boyfriend and I run nine, 10 minute miles together. See, there's hope for don't all believe at it. some point. <laughs> want to go through that. Uh, do you have a highlight from your career? Give me a race that you just were like, boy, I'd love to run that race again and produce that same performance. Um, I think the race that you're talking about when I ran 159, I didn't, I didn't think I could really win. I knew Meredith Rainey was the one to, to beat, but boy, it was something I could never have imagined running under two minutes in college. So that one is probably the best one for me. And do you have a college race you'd like to take back? I mean, there, there, there aren't many that seem like they didn't go your way. Um, not really, I can't think of any. <laughs> That's a really good career when mm -hmm. we're like, nope, I think all the races I had were, I have a favorite, but I don't have any that were least favorites. Right. Uh, congratulations Thank to you. all of you. Um, Thank you. And congratulations, um, Linda, on behalf Thank of you. your brother and, and the legacy that he has left behind and everybody continues to honor. Thank you. Let's meet our next group starting with Jackie Johnson. at Arizona State on a basketball scholarship, but it was in track and field, and in particular, in events that showcased her extreme athleticism, where Jackie Johnson would make her mark. Johnson's dominant performances in the outdoor heptathlon and indoor pentathlon were crucial to ASU's three NCAA team titles during her time in Tempe, as this Sun Devil became a collegiate record holder in the pentathlon and was the fourth woman in NCAA outdoor meet history to record four victories in one event, dominating the heptathlon each time. She's one of the most decorated athletes in school history, and now she's a Hall of Famer. Welcome, Arizona State's Jackie Johnson. Please welcome to the stage, Jackie Johnson Powell. And presenting the Hall of Fame medal, Arizona State Director of Cross Country and Track and Field, Dion Miller. One more round of applause for Jackie Johnson Powell.
Let's meet our next inductee. Before there was Jesse Owens, or Carl Lewis, or any other Hall of Famer, there was DeHart Hubbard, who is, without a doubt, the original GOAT. Hubbard also was a Michigan Wolverine, and during his time in Ann Arbor, he became the first black athlete in any sport to win an NCAA title. While still a student at Michigan, Hubbard broke barriers at the 1924 Olympics as well, when he sailed past his competitors in the long jump to become the first black athlete to win an individual gold medal. And tonight, he takes his rightful place in the Hall of Fame. Hail, hail to Michigan's DeHart Hubbard. Accepting on behalf of DeHart Hubbard, nephew and former Ohio Secretary of State, Ken Blackwell. And presenting Michigan assistant coach, James Henry. One more time for DeHart Hubbard and let's meet our next inductee. Suleiman Nambui became a name that gained the utmost of respect. That's what happens when you become the winningest athlete in NCAA track and field history for your generation. A 15-time NCAA champion at UTEP, Nambui claimed four straight NCAA titles in the 10,000 meters, three consecutive championships in the 5,000, and became the only Division I male to win four straight indoor mile championships, all while leading the minors to a four-year sweep of the outdoor team title. In 1980, he was crowned the NCAA cross-country champion after picking up a silver medal at the Summer Olympics in the 5,000 meters. UTEP's Suleiman Nambui is now in the Hall of Fame. Put your hands together for Suleiman Nambui. Come on down. And presenting UTEP head coach Micah Lakasanen. And one more time for Suleiman Nambui. And let's meet our final inductee of the group. Jesse Owens was a Buckeye, but he also was the GOAT. I mean, he once won four events at the Big Ten Championships in a span of 45 minutes with world records in all of them. And no Division I student athlete has ever claimed four individual titles at the NCAA championships, much less been able to duplicate that performance the very next year. That's a total of eight NCAA titles in two years of varsity competition for Ohio State, a mark that has stood the test of time. The man never lost an event during his collegiate career, and his Olympic story is just as legendary. From the Ohio State University to one of the greatest of all time, we salute Jesse Owens. Accepting on behalf of Jesse Owens, granddaughters Marlene Dorch and Gina Strawn, presenting Ohio State Director of Track and Field, Karen Dennis. the genius said, let's put the Ohio State and the Michigan people together. That'll be awesome. <laughs> Feel bad for Suleiman. You're in the middle there, but just, you just keep the peace, all right? We're good. I guess since you have the mic, we'll start with you. Is that all right? Fine with me. I mean, uh, and, and we're not, unlike uh, Cincinnati mayors in the past, we don't have to throw out a first ball. You're in good, you're in good, you're in good hands here. We'll take care. Already. Um, uh, your grandfather is the oldest of the class, 1923, of all the people inducted. He's basically the first of this inaugural class. Um, what should we know about that man? He was focused not only on athletics, but, but scholarship. But he came from a family that believed that the, the family was the incubator of liberty. Uh, and that it, togetherness, close-knitness, 
uh, in the family uh, could in fact uh, elevate you to higher, higher levels mm -hmm. of uh, quality of life uh, and achievement. He, uh, he, he, he believed in, let me just tell you where it underscored it for me. In the 1924 games, mm -hmm. um, he set the world record in the long jump, but he said God had blessed him to let him see something, to let him be a witness of Eric Little deciding not to run in the finals mm -hmm. because of fidelity to faith. And that became the watch phrase for our family, fidelity to faith. We understood that we in fact played for an audience of one that was a higher force in our lives and that was God. And I think that gave him a, a sense that there was a dignity, a, a legacy of worthiness in each one of us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was his gift to us. If I had met him, would I have known he was a track star? Uh, yeah, because he used to sell papers uh, and he would run from house to house. Uh -huh. and, and, and he was quite, he was quite fast. <laughs> uh -huh. How about at 50, would I have known that? Yeah, he was in, still in pretty good shape. He was mm -hmm. uh, very... But I mean, he, he, he was open about his successes. He was, he was uh, um, willing to talk and share about his great career. Yeah, because he believed in the, the discipline of hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, was, that was another one of his gifts, not only the pursuit of scholarship, but, but hard work. And he believed in the dignity of work. Uh, and that was expressed in athletics. Uh, and you could still see it in every walk of his life. Well, it's, it was wonderful to see that bid for those of us that are not as familiar with his story, uh, but every bit the Hall of Famer of all these folks here. So it's a, it's a fabulous story and a fabulous athlete. Um, I will now dr go to um, equal time if you want to hand that down to the Ohio State University. <laughs> and we'd want to talk. I want to know um, why your grandfather's career and his legacy is still so important today. Oh, boy. Um, I think because of um, the way he did it. Um, I think because of, in addition to the accomplishments on the track, I think his story is bigger than track and field. I think his story, his legacy is one that um, is important because of persevering through um, obstacles, um, persevering at a time when um, you weren't necessarily supposed to, um, but also because of what he stood for, because of the man that he was, because of how it was important for him to um, make a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to the legacy of all of these um, amazing people who are represented here tonight and being honored tonight as they they represent so much more than their actual accomplishments mm -hmm. on the track. What's it like to have a grandfather that everybody knew? Well, my grandfather was a farmer and he was a hell of a guy, but nobody knows him outside of his you know, acreage in Iowa. What's it like to, to be in that line and have people go, wow, Jesse Owen, what do what, I, because I imagine you were bombarded constantly about well, I'll share my experience and my, and my sister can share hers. But for us growing up, he really was only granddad. Like he was granddad. Um, you know, you, you spend time with your grandparents. We were fortunate enough to spend time with him. You know, he was very busy. Um, but there were times when we would be out to dinner or something and we'd be like, why does everybody make such a big deal out of granddad? Like, what is the big deal? <laughs> And so I think really just kind of like learning about who he was. Um, and I had the opportunity to go to Munich with him to the 72 Olympics. And it was one of the first times he had been back to um, Germany since 36. And the experience for me was, I, I was very young at the time. And so the experience of going to the games was one thing, but going with him was something and totally different. If you can imagine, and I'm sure many of the young people here can relate to, when Michael Jackson would be in a car and driving and people would mob the car, they'd run down the street chasing the car. That was the experience I had with him in Munich. Jesse Owens, Jesse Owens. 
and they just wanted to be near him, you know. Um, and for me, that was um, an experience that I certainly will never forget. But he really was just granddad. Take your feet off the couch, just like, you know, <laughs> eat all your food, all of those things. He was just granddad. I don't know. We kind of had the same experience. One thing, a couple of things I know. I know he loved the Ohio State University. Yes, he did. And really, his experience really changed the life of our whole family. Like he was the first to go to college. My, my mother, my aunt, uh, my, I went to Ohio State for law school. My son's at Ohio State now. So just the opportunity that being a collegiate athlete provides for students. Not everyone's going to be an Olympian, mm -hmm. but taking just the opportunity to be at a university to compete, uh, that can change a ge generations. And that's certainly what his experience did for our family and we have mm -hmm. in our family teachers and social workers and attorneys and principals and broadcasters and that allowed us to serve our community and I think that that was a blessing and I really appreciate just meeting people who I don't even know and they tell me how much he meant to them. People who aren't athletes mm -hmm. who just hearing his story, and I know that's true of so many of the athletes here today in their communities, what it really means to be great and for young people to see you being your best, it, it makes a difference in people's lives and then makes a difference in the world. You talk about the line he, he did with your, your family, but if you look at these Hall of Famers too, he's kind of the thread through a lot of this, right? Carl Lewis matched. Jesse Owens, uh, Ralph Boston broke Jesse Owens. Right? Like we have a lot of that throughout this whole class of these 20 men. So many of them are measured in their accomplishments by what uh, Jesse Owens did, which is remarkable in addition to all the wonderful things you say about your granddad. Uh, Suleiman, it would be great, but we're out of time. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming all this. No. Uh, <laughs> Hey, so I'm going to give you one more race to run. You're going to run cross country. You're going to run a five, a ten, a mile. What do you want to run? Uh, today, I'm just here to to show the people and to show the the world that Great America helped all of country through the scholarships. Mm -hmm. So that's the very important things which I'm proud of it. So because uh, NCAs. As I know, it started a long, long time. So it didn't start for only for Americans. It started in many countries, especially poor, poor African country like Tanzania, the other one, they'll be attending a lot of schools. They come to the college, so, and it was my advantage to be in America and any education and maintain my learning, able to keep my scholarship alive. So that's what I was doing that time when I was in college. Mm -hmm. I was self-disciplined. I'd like to lose my scholarship because I come from, let's say, poor family. So that's why I was doing that job, which I know I was more aged than a young American because at the time I came, I was 26 mm -hmm. and uh, competed with the American kids 18 years, but I was not only a foreigner which I was overaged. I think there were more foreigners which mm -hmm. they were more aged, but they were focusing more on me because I was winning the race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so all the eyes was Nyambui, Suleimani, Suleimani, because I was winning, but other colleges, universities, there were more than foreigners than me. So, but I'm happy I did a good job and uh, America made me to go to Olympics in 1980. Otherwise, I should go to get to Olympics. Because I'm proud of America, I'm happy, and uh, uh, always I enjoyed to see Kyle Lewis, <laughs> Jack Joy over there. Always I was seeing them in Europe and over here. Always I enjoy very much. Because I remember Kyle Lewis was the 
San Monica Track Club was a very powerful in the world. Mm -hmm. So I can see them in Europe where they dominate all the races. So I was so enjoyed. And my first, my first is 1973 when I came, first time when I came from Tanzania going to Europe, I saw the late Profen, uh, Steve Profentain mm -hmm. running near Sinki. So I enjoyed very much. He was my mentor. He was my mentor when I saw him running. It's like he mustang the, the horse. He was running and you see the hair going back there. <laughs> oh, man, I was impressed. From there, then I was thinking that I want to run like Prof, you know, see Profontaine. That's why it's my mind all the time. Mm -hmm. I end up to become, uh, become a good runner. Yes. Well, I can't imagine what it would be like to get a call in Tanzania and say you're going to go to UTEP and to tell your family that you're going to make this broad uh, excursion, this jump, and, and go out and, and make a better life for yourself. But it was a, uh, it was a bold and courageous step, and, and the sport is better for it, as you say you are too. And congratulations on your honor here tonight. Thank you very much. So, uh, I ask this to all my multi-athlete uh, friends. Uh, like, why do five and seven sports when you can be really famous for one? I, I don't know. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea why I did five or seven. I just know my coach kept putting me in different events. <laughs> and he realized that I was good at all of these events, mm -hmm. and I became a multi-eventer shortly mm -hmm. after that. <laughs> did we have one we enjoyed more than others? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hunter Hurdles. Loved it. I, I think I ran faster over hurdles than I did just straight. But that's because that's big points, though, right? You can you can score huge in the hurdles. Oh yeah, faster. hurdles, the first event. Um, that sets the pace. Did we enjoy that? Because uh, it's I was at, my daughter ran high school track, and so uh, this year I'm watching because we finally had seasons of high school track again, which was amazing. But there's no kid that just one runs one event, right? They all run. They're here and here, and you're like, why are we not long jumping? Well, because that person's over the the 200 or the 400. Uh, was that the kind of kid you were and that sitting around idly is, you know, it, it's boring? That was the kid I was before I even ran track. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was literally climbing fences, climbing trees. Um, my mom couldn't sit me still. That's why they put me on the track and said, you're going to track pra practice with your sister because uh -huh. I can't keep you still. Give me a lesson from track that, that and, and whether it was from your coach or just you learned it from, from your own experiences. Uh, but something from the track that, that's paid off that you still kind of lean into today. Yes. What I lean into today is you don't, you leave everything out on the track. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, wh whether that is anything that you do in life, that's what I do now. I work hard at what I do. I have five kids at home. So I, every day I try to leave everything out on the track and teach them that hard work definitely sure. pays off the, as long as you put in the effort. Did you go for seven? Because that'd be really symmetrical, right? Well, five and go for seven, because that would be awesome. You could give them each one event. I should have went for seven. However, yeah. the pentathlon will stick with five. That's where we're going to go. And then my starting five, right? Basketball sure, for us basketball lot of fans there. out there. Uh, last thing is I just want to know, like, we're sitting up here with Jackie Owen, uh, Jesse Owens, excuse me, granddaughters, and, and the heart up. Like, what's it like to be a part of this group? Um, I can't even form the words into sentences to tell you how honored I am to be here with the goats, these goats standing in front of you right next to me. You're one of them. I know. And that's awesome, too. That's why right? I can't yeah. put the words Don't together. Don't sure. Very good. Congratulations <laughs> to all of you again. Thank you for your time. Congratulations. Hold on. We're going to set. We've got another. We're going to go to our next group, and we'll, uh, we'll start the video, and then we'll, we'll, we'll make our hasty exit. It was the shot heard around the world, and it rang even louder in front of the cheering Texas A&M home crowd at Kyle Field that day in 1965. That's when Aggie sophomore Randy Matson, who had claimed silver at the Olympic Games the year before, heaved the shot almost three feet farther than it had ever been launched before. As a collegian, Matson made a habit of breaking world records, namely his own, culminating in the world's first 71-footer during his final season. He concluded an undefeated NCAA career by sweeping the shot and discus crowns for the second year in a row. Now, this record-setting Aggie is a Hall of Famer. From Texas A&M, 
Randy Matson. Accepting on behalf of Randy Matson, Texas A&M head coach Pat Henry. And let's meet our next inductee. Merlene Audi won more national titles, garnered more All-American awards, and basically stunned more competitors than any woman has ever done at Nebraska. Make that all of collegiate track and field, as no woman has more Division I national collegiate titles than Audi's 14, including five combined indoor and outdoor titles in 1982 and four in 1981. She remains the only athlete male or female, in the history of the track and field championships to score in the 100, 200, and 400 meters in the same NCAA Division I meet. And her versatility led the Huskers to three consecutive indoor team titles. She also happens to be the school's most accomplished Olympian, and tonight, she's a Hall of Famer. From Nebraska, Merlene Audi. Accepting on behalf of Merlene Audi, Nebraska Associate Head Coach Justin St. Clair. Country Hall of Fame. My most memorable moments as an Oscar were at the 1983 NC2A Track and Field Championships. I participated in four events the 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, and the four by 100 meters relay. It was a fantastic way to end my collegiate athletic career. Thank you, Merlene, and let's go ahead and meet our next inductee. The very first time Meg Ritchie donned an Arizona uniform as a freshman shot putter and discus thrower, she set a record. Heck, it seemed like every time Ritchie stepped inside the throwing circle, another mark would fall. While crushing the competition, her career best throws broke every school, collegiate, conference, and national record. Ritchie's collegiate record in the discus remains unbroken to this day and it took 33 years to surpass her long-standing mark in the shot put. And in 1982, Richie scored a shot and discus double at the NCAA Championships. She broke the mold and smashed the record books. And tonight, Arizona's Meg Richie's name is listed in the Hall of Fame. very very fortunate to be supported very well by the teammates I had at that time and by the coaching staff at the University of Arizona. The competition that I remember most is Mount Sac Relays 1984 where I broke the British record but also the collegiate record. A gentleman, very tall gentleman coming up to me after I had thrown and realising that that was Will Chamberlain congratulating me on the throw. So, um, fun, fun memories of Mount Sac. Excellent meet, uh, watch it every year. Um, and I am really fortunate that I was around at the time that Mount Sac, Mount Sac was a big, big part of the collegiate scene and still is. Thank you, and thank you for inducting me. I really appreciate the honour. Thanks. Accepting on behalf of Meg Ritchie, Arizona Director of Cross Country and Track and Field, Fred Harvey. Thank you, Fred. I'll take the stage one more time, and at this moment, I'd like to introduce the president of the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Coaches Association, Leroy Burrell, and head coach of the Houston Cougars. Come on out here. Man, I look at you, I feel like I got to get in the weight room more. Uh, <laughs> this is not the weight room. <laughs> I think when you look at tonight, I just want to ask you, what is the value 
of this Hall of Fame because the names that we've heard so far really have created the history of the sport at the collegiate level. Now we get a chance tonight to celebrate them. Well, just as you, as you just mentioned, uh, this is a celebration of a century of excellence. Uh, this sport has created some unbelievable people who have really changed our country. And uh, those of you who are here who will be competing and watching our young athletes competing this weekend, you are, you are standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, I just couldn't be happier that we've been able to put this event on. And it, it just means so much to uh, the history, the legacy, and the future of our sport. You mentioned Giants. Let's introduce our next inductee, Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis defied the stopwatch and gravity en route to becoming one of the greatest track and field athletes of all time. Lewis was so dominating during his collegiate career at Houston, in fact, he won all six NCAA competitions he entered. He was so versatile, he became the first athlete to win a track event and a field event at the same NCAA indoor championships and at the same NCAA outdoor championships. Lewis stamped his name into the record books with four collegiate marks and one world record during his days as a Cougar. And apparently, he was just getting started, as his Olympic story is one for the ages. They called him King Carl. We call him a Hall of Famer. Let's hear it for Houston's own Carl Lewis. Please welcome to the stage Carl Lewis. And presenting the Hall of Fame medal, Leroy Burrell. And one more time for Carl Lewis as we meet our next inductee. They called Ralph Metcalf the world's fastest human. And he wore the title well during his record-setting Marquette career. The classic example of a powerhouse runner, Metcalf turned on the burners to overtake his opponents, sealing the victory in the last few yards and frequently stamping his name into the record books. At one point during his collegiate career, he equaled or bettered 13 world records, with four of them in NCAA competition. After his first NCAA sweep of the 100 and 220 yard titles in 1932, Metcalf earned a silver and bronze in the Olympics. Then he made history by becoming the first man to win both short sprints at the NCAA championships three times in a row. Please welcome Marquette's Ralph Metcalf to the Hall of Fame. Accepting on behalf of Ralph Metcalf, grandson Nasser Metcalf, and presenting Marquette Director of Track and Field and Cross Country, Bert Rogers. And one more time for Ralph Metcalf as we get set to meet our next inductee. Did you happen to see that blur? It's Carlette Guidry, running from the track to the infield, back to the track again. This Texas Longhorn seemingly did it all during her collegiate career. Sprints, long jump, relays, and she has the titles to prove it. Guidry leaped to an NCAA indoor long jump crown as a freshman. 21 feet, three quarters of an inch, as she heads into the final. And just kept going. As one of the premier sprinters of all time, she claimed 12 total championships, combining individual and relay events, and her seven individual sprint national titles are tied for the most ever by any man or woman in NCAA Division I history. She's a Longhorn legend. And tonight, Texas's Carlette Guidry is a Hall of Famer. Please welcome to the stage, Carlette Guidry. And presenting Texas head coach Edric Florial. One more round of applause for Carlette Guidry as we take a look at one more inductee. 
Mel Patton already was known as a big man on campus at USC, but on one day in 1948, he picked up an even more impressive title, World's Fastest Man. That's what they call you when you clock in at 9.3 seconds in the 100-yard dash and smash a long-standing world record. A year later, Patton went 20.2 in the 220 on a straightaway to break Jesse Owens' world standard. With two Olympic gold medals already on his resume, during his days at USC, this Trojan sprinter also became a three-time NCAA 100 champ and also ran to national titles in the 200 meters in 1948 and 220 yards in 1949. Fight on for Hall of Famer Mel Patton of USC. Accepting on behalf of Mel Patton's son, Gary Patton, and presenting Southern California Director of Track and Field and Cross Country, Quincy Watts. I got room. <clears throat> Fight on. Tell me what your, your, your father would have thought of this honor. Thought of his home? This honor. Oh, this honor. He, he was very proud of doing what he did, um, but it was a goal that he set, and he believed in setting goals mm -hmm. and striving for those. Mm -hmm. What kind of a man was he outside of the track? Uh, Honest, integrity, those were the things that he tried to uh, project mm -hmm. and uh, didn't talk much, but just examples setting. You talk much about his accomplishments at SC and on the track? Not really. No, uh, you know, we knew what he did. Um, he was more interested in the family and taking uh, steps where he needed to take steps, mm -hmm. you know, what he needed to do. Any stories you can share about him talking about his time at SC? Uh, just that he uh, strived to do as much as he possibly could. He had close friends that uh, he dealt with, mm -hmm. but we didn't talk about much mm -hmm. of the college. Mm -hmm. uh, any of that trickle down? Like, you ever have an interest in that? Not in the sports, but the, <laughs> but the integrity aspect. Uh, that was something that was very strong mm -hmm. in me and being honest. Good, good enough. And uh, another, I saw Quincy, I said, Jeepers, like, you guys got 200, 400, 400 guys. I mean, every decade, every year they have people. It's remarkable. Um, Carl Lewis, we're going to save you for last. Let's put it down to, let's go to an answer, my cat. By the way, you favor your grandfather. People so I'm told. tell you that, right? Like that's it doesn't it's incredible when he's what I hear. Wow, that's that's amazing. What did he tell you about his career when he was there at Marquette running around in circles? So he passed away when I was about eight years old. So we didn't get a chance to get into that as much as I would have liked to and I often reflect on it and, and wonder what those conversations could have been like had he lived a little bit longer for me to get older enough to really understand and appreciate what he did and, and be able to dialogue with him about it. But um, you know, he, he was just grandpa to me. Yeah, that's about it. You know, it was just a personal relationship. All of his legend, all of his accomplishments. I became more familiar with that later in life. Pretty much. And what that. do you think when you become more familiar with that? You're like, wow, um, granddad I, yeah, and Jeff well, Owens are like, they're like. It, bar gets set pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, of course, beaming with pride and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and appreciation and, and, um, and humbly honored. Uh, to you know, come from such a legacy, and to um, allow that to be a guidepost for me in my own life, and uh, anything that I seek to accomplish, knowing that I have ancestors who accomplished so much uh, prior to me, that uh, gives me my own, my own strength and fortitude to move forward. Whether it was you, know, you said you were eight, but whether him or what you got from your parents, was he more inclined to speak about uh, track and field or about his career in Palm? It depends on which day you caught him on. Uh, he, he was just as inclined to speak about either one uh, if, if you were to inquire. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, naturally he was 
more uh, involved in his political career when I, during my lifetime. So that's the version of him that I saw, you know, out and about with the public and engaging with the community. Uh, and I, one of my favorite memories of him is uh, when uh, I got to go to work with him one day. And uh, he was going to his office to, you know, put in a day's work. Uh, he had two bodyguards who were two Chicago police uh, officers, and they were driving. And uh, one was driving, and one was in the passenger seat. And I was in the back seat with my grandfather. He had a notebook open. He was going over some notes and some things that he had to prepare for for his day as a U.S. congressman. Uh, so, I, being a precocious child, like I said, I was eight when he passed. So, you know, I was a, I was a tyke when uh, when this was happening. So. I just wanted to play, and I and I kept playing with one of the officers, the one that was sitting in front of me. I kept like plucking his ear and everything like that, and, and, uh, and, and so he was being kind about it. But I mean, he did have a gun on him, so I didn't, you know, I didn't want, him, I didn't want any problems. No, but uh, my grandfather noticed that I just, you know, had all this energy and attention, the the the, the average energy and attention of a child that age. So he closed his notebook, and he said, "You know what? Don't play with him. Just play with me." And he played with me the whole time in the back seat on the way to the car, uh, on the way to the office in the back seat of the car. Uh, so, uh, so you know, we had a nice time. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, this is way off, way, way, way off base. But uh, did you were you really a bodyguard for Prince? <laughs> <laughs> I know this has nothing to do with, with Metcalf. But... Yes, I was. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, something to talk about at the after party when we do that. <laughs> did you hear what he asked me? Dude, yeah, dude was a, he was a, uh, he was a bodyguard for Prince. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. It's unique. Yeah, let's get nuts. Let's pass it over to Carlette and just uh, a bit. First off, so you got a daughter, and you're going to let her run with with Carl and and Leroy. Is that correct? Oh yes, most definitely. I think she's going to be in some great hands. She's going to learn a lot. Um, she's a very um, late bloomer in track and field. I just kind of kept her around track and field, and kind of um, let her find her track and field. You know, I had my track and field, but I wanted her to find her track and field mm -hmm. because I didn't want to have that pressure of being Carlette Guidry's daughter. And um, she found her way, and she found a great home. And um, I'm very happy and excited for her and her new journey. And she's gonna do. She's gonna do well. And that's okay with Flo, right? Ed Edricks, he's behind this decision all the way. He agreed with 100 percent. I bet. Yes. If you, by the way, is that burnt orange that dress? That looks. Oh, most awesome, definitely. Right? Right. Burn orange every day. I bleed so, burn orange. You, <laughs> you would like your daughter to define her track, define your track experience. Well, um, it's, um, it, it's all coming full circle, um, starting with um, Rod Milburn, where my family, um, my parents are from Opelousas, Louisiana. And my mom lived maybe like a block away from um, Rod Milburn. And um, my, I have uncles that went to school with him. So that's the start of it when I was coming up. And I remember as a young girl watching the Wilma Rudolph story. Mm -hmm. That's when I fell in love with track and field, and that's when I wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist like Wilma Rudolph. And then I wasn't very good at running, so I, I just kept and persisted. Everybody says consistency, hard work, and determination, and that's what um, kept me going. I even I was even coached by Carl Lewis's mother when I was a little little squirt. So everything's coming full circle. My track and field was one where I wanted to be, I wanted something different in my life. And I wanted to be different in a way that I wanted to be successful. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to make something out of my life, my way. And um, I had some great people around me that influenced me and guided me. And I have a lot of great people still with me. What's it like to be the fastest kid? Because we all grow up, everybody knows who the fastest kid in their neighborhood is. Like, what's it like to be the fastest kid? Oh, well, that's a, hmm, that's a tough question. You know, I never thought of it that way, of being the fastest. I always thought of being the one that's out there working the hardest. If I work the hardest, if I do what my coaches tell me, if I eat right, if I do those, th if I do my homework off the track, I'm going to be the fastest. It's going to be second nature. You know, you practice and you train hard and you have those fears and you accept those fears. You go through those fears and you come out on top. Mm -hmm. By the way, when they called and said, you're a member of this inaugural class, and oh well, Wilma Rudolph is in this class too, what'd you think of that? I was, I think I was more excited of being a part of history with someone as um, legendary as Wilma Rudolph. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, let's give it over here to Carl since he's going to be in charge of your daughter's <laughs> workouts for the next four years. <laughs> That's a hell of a thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. Well, I remember you from high school, you know, so I've known your whole career. We've been on teams together. So it's, it's, it's an honor that you think that you entrust her with, with me. I'm a, but I got you. <laughs> That's the exact same speech he gave on the couch in their living room. He's now giving it again here at the Halt Center for the Performing Arts. Um, as much as Jesse Owens defines this class, you probably define the last... 40 years in track and field. Um, and you did things that Jesse Owens, matched things like Jesse Owens. How do you view Jesse Owens, Ralph Metcalf, uh, uh, Boston? I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, these, I, like these are your legacy yes. that you um, come just, to next. Just special. I mean, I, I'm sitting here and I met Jesse Owens when I was young. Um, so I, I got a chance to hear, and I remember he had an amazing voice, and when he told stories, he was only talking to me, and that's how I felt, because it was so honest. And when you asked earlier what was his thing, he loved children. He really did. He ended his life loving children, and that was an effect on me. Um, I, I look at, we talked about Rod Bilburn when I went to Houston. I was a freshman in college. He was still training there, so I got the chance to see him when, towards the end of his career. My first team I ever made, I was 17. I met Chandra Cheeseboro was on the team. I was 17. I went to the Pan Am Games. No one went to play with me, you know. <laughs> and so, but they were so kind. Um, and, and Ralph Boston, I had an article of his on my bulletin board because I respected and admired what he did. So it, it's, there were so many things that affected me. And I had wonderful parents. The reason I started track is because my mother wanted track and field for girls. And they allowed us to do it. In my first year, um, it was only girls program, so we couldn't do it. I was only seven. And they said, go into the long jump pit and just act like you're at the beach. And that's the true story. So the first year, my sister and I played in the long jump pit like we were building castles and all that kind of stuff. And that's how it all started. And so, and I, and so I met all these people. And it just every single one of them had, you know, touched my life in a different way. And to think from like 10th grade being a 5'5 five five kid that was 120 pounds, um, just the number one goal of my life was to be taller than my mother, you know, mm -hmm. to two years later being ranked fifth in the world. It's just, it was just magical. Two years at Houston, right? Yeah. Before you, before you decided to go. But, and I kind of cheat because I heard some of the answer we talked at lunch today, but like you went to college with a very specific plan right. of what your career was going to be. Why don't you yeah. share that? Well, when I, when I was 17, I knew I wanted to, to, to jump farther than Bob Beeman. I wanted to jump 29 feet. And I measured it in the yard, and that was my goal. And so part of my college experience or, or looking is at who was willing to help me do that. And that was a big challenge. And the one thing that Coach Telez did, uh, he, he was a, an amazing guy. He was technical and everything. He wasn't about um, – uh, wasn't trying to convince me to do anything. Cause he, even to this day, he's pretty – just blah, but he's he's caring and, and specific, you know, because when it meets <laughs> over, he's like, bye, I'm going to the plane, you know. Blah. So, but, but when I, I said to him, I said, can you help me jump 29 feet? And he said, well, let's look at some videotape, <laughs> you know. So we started looking at tape, and he started showing me things about jumpers. And that's what kind of did it for me, because I, I wanted to do that. And, and, and the first day, this is a true, true thing, the first day we sat down, when I got to Houston, he said, well, what do you want? And I said, Coach, I, I've been watching other sports. I want to be like them. And so what I want is I want to be a millionaire, and I never want a real job, and I'm going to do it as a track athlete. And that was it. And he just looked at me. He's like, well, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> well, of course, I didn't, I didn't know that track made no money, but, but that was it. You know, I had all these goals and aspirations, you know. And so, um, but I just learned from people. I learned from everyone because I just sucked. I, I met Prince and I asked him, what do I do? What's going on? And, and um, he's like, just be a star out there. And so anyone I saw, I was just like a sponge. And I, I, I didn't make up anything. I just learned everything. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny you can talk about money because at that time, and, and we saw it a little when, if you know the legacy of Pre, and uh, I will be doing um, the NCAA meet with Dwight Stones. And I know Dwight, I think he's here somewhere. He's here, I saw him. Right, so right, back when you guys were like, at that time, money was a crime yeah. almost in the sport, right? Like, how'd you overcome that? 
Uh, it, was, it was not easy. You know, I mean, basically saying we, we when I when I came up with the line and I said, well, amateurism was basically glorified slavery. It wasn't very popular. Mm -hmm. And so th the thing is, the first thing was overcoming in, in a broad sense. And I know Dwight will understand the broad sense of the athletes saying we should be happy to get uniforms. And I said, why don't you pay me and I'll buy my own uniforms? I'll, let's do that. And so it was just it was just equality. You know, I, I, I watched on TV with the other sports and I'm like, we're working just as hard. So I, I studied people, you know, studying people like Billie Jean King and, and Kurt Flood and Bill Russell and these people. And I saw what they did to change their sports. And I said, why can't we do that? And so that's what drove me. It was hard. It was because every time, every turn, they were trying to stop it. But I was determined. And fortunately, I had the talent and then ultimately had a lot of support and, and we were able to get there. It took about, ten, about eight years to get to where we were actually technically professional. Make the mill. Sorry? You make the million? Uh, I did okay. Good for you. Uh, I got one more. I got one more. You mean in I, a year? I, yes. One more. I just want another. Uh, literally, they had to talk into the 100 and the 200. Yeah. That seems astonishing because um, you ran really fast and got gold medals in those two. And it's hard to believe that you did that reluctantly. Well, it, it, you know what? <laughs> when I came out of college, I just wanted to be a long jumper. And I wanted to help my team win. And, you know, of course, I went to Houston, and, which is Southwest Conference. Mm -hmm. And so I was there about two months, and I already hated all the other schools. So I came from New Jersey, didn't know anything about these schools, but I became a U of H guy, conference guy right away. And so in order to help the team, I started running better. But then I realized that I had the talent to sprint. And if we're going to achieve those goals, you had to have the, 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 that title of world's fastest human, which was really important. And so that was the first step. And then um, the long jump was going well and the 100 was going well. So then it was like, why don't we just do all four? And luckily for, mm -hmm. for me, the 84 Olympics was coming up. And, you know, I'd already missed the Olympics from the boycott. So I, I was like, well, this is the perfect spot to, to blow everything up. And, and that was it. Well, amongst this whole uh, Hall of Fame and every one of these inductees that are so talented and, and with uh, a tip of the cap to Usain Bolt, I don't think I, I'll fight any man in the room that uh, will want to uh, beg to differ that you're the, the greatest living track and field athlete still to this day. And congratulations Thank on you. this. Thank and thanks you. for Thank being here. Thank you so here. much. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to wrap this up. We don't exactly have one shining moment, but we've got something close. So we want you to take a look at this. And so we recognize one more time the inaugural class, the class of 2022 to the College Athlete Hall of Fame.
We'll have the inductees stay for pictures, everyone else. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. And hopefully everybody's over at Hayward on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for the 100th NCAA Championships on the men's side and the 40th for the women. Thanks again, and thanks to our folks here at the Holt, uh, Holt Theater.